Well, good morning, church family. How's everybody doing this morning? We're glad that you're here. Come on, let's stand to our feet. We're in this room, East Worship Center. Those that are watching online, feel free to stand with us as well. We wanted to start off this morning maybe a little bit different, and uh, we realize that there is uh, sometimes chaotic weeks when we walk into Sunday morning experiencing all different things, and sometimes it's a jolt to get started. And uh, if you're anything like me, you know, we have four kiddos, and so we have dropped off our kids and, you know, the whole forgot the shoes and the whole whole bit. So we get sometimes how, how Sunday mornings can be. But before we dive in, I want to read for us in uh, Psalm uh, 29, one, it says this. It says, ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. And worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. This morning, that's what we get to be able to do together corporately as we come together, bringing all of our stories and all of our past week experiences uh, to the throne and saying, God, we need you. And we give you all the glory and all the honor. You're worthy of it. And so let's pray this morning as we acknowledge our dependence on him today. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you for the privilege that it is to be in this space. God, we do. We we acknowledge our dependence on you today. And, God, as we sing together, as we hear your word taught, as we pray, as we take communion, God, we pray that you'd be glorified in it all. And so, God, would you... Just move in this place in a way that maybe is unexpected to each one of us. God, that whatever circumstance that we're facing, that we can give it to you today in this moment. And God, that you would be glorified through all of this. This is all for you. So we love you. We worship you this morning, spirit and in truth. Let's sing together. Come on. See you. 
more than I could fathom. God, your love for me is better than.
Come on, church, let's celebrate the Lord. He's worthy of our praise, our adoration. Amen. Amen. It's so good to sing that song, remind us of who's on the throne. And also to remind us what Jesus has done for each one of us. And this morning, we've been taking communion every single week, the past couple weeks. And so we're going to do the same today. And so if you walked in and grabbed a communion element, I'd love for you to grab that out right now. And as we reflect on Jesus' sacrifice, we're going to take communion together. So if you would, go ahead and pull back that first layer here. You can hold this in your hand with me. I'm going to read for us in 1 Corinthians. It says this. So the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. So do this in remembrance of me. Let's go ahead and partake. Remember the body that was shed on our behalf, nails pierced his body. You can go ahead and tear back that next layer, communion cup. So read this next section and hold this up together. It said, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's take this together. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the great sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf. Father, his body that was pierced, was bruised, was broken, the blood that was shed on our behalf, that we stand here in remembrance, gratitude, thankfulness for that sacrifice. So in this moment, as we reflect, pray that we would recall the pain and the agony that you went through for each one of us. We thank you. There's not much more to say but that. We thank you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's continue to worship. Let's continue to sing this chorus together. Let's lift it up loud in this place, okay?
amen. Psalm 9 says, those who know your name trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Those who know your name, they trust in you. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. We know him. We know who he is. We know he's faithful. We know he can be counted on. And so we're grateful for the reality of who Jesus is and the fact that we can have the sweetness of knowing and trusting in him. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. So glad to be with you this morning. Thank you for worshiping together in this place. My name is John. I want to welcome you here and just say thank you for coming together to fellowship and to worship and to lift your voice in one accord as we worship the true King of Kings, Lord of Lords. So glad that we get to uh, do that together as a church family. I want to tell you some ways in which we are continuing to connect together as a family. Uh, first, if you're new to our church and uh, maybe this is your first Sunday, I met someone in the last service who it was. They just looked us up online and said, I'm going to come and I'm going to be a part of the fellowship. And um, God met him in this place last service. So really grateful for that. If that's you today, we'd love to meet you. Stop by the place in the atrium we call the Connection Center. Uh, make yourself known to us and give us the opportunity of just greeting you. We'd love to uh, get to know you, to encourage you, and also to help you find your place of belonging here. We're a church on mission, on mission to ensure that every man, every woman, and every child have repeated opportunities to hear and to see the gospel of Jesus Christ. We were just talking about the sweetness of knowing and trusting in Jesus, knowing that the only hope that's real and true and permanent can be found in Jesus Christ, that good news of the gospel, we're on mission as a church to ensure that those around us know about it as well. We participate in that mission a number of different ways. First, through prayer, and I would encourage the church, continue to pray. Pray when you get up in the morning. Pray when you go to bed. God, would you use me? Would you use us to accomplish the mission around us? Allow us to see the opportunities that we have to minister to our neighbors and our friends and our coworkers, to hold out the hope that we profess so others around us would ask us about it and we'd be able to share that truth with, good, with, uh, with those around us. We also give an opportunity to, uh, to participate in the mission through giving, and I want to encourage you to continue in that. You can go to thechapel.com slash give, or you can use the Church Center app, or you can use the boxes as you're leaving today that have the word give above them, because together as we steward those resources, we are together accomplishing the mission through the local church to see many things take place together that we couldn't do on our own. So thank you for your continued generosity in that regard. And then also we participate through service. Many of you are serving on a Sunday morning, you're serving throughout the week, you're engaging in the body of Christ and using the gifts and talents that God's given you to participate in that. One thing I wanna remind you of that's coming up as a way for us together to come and rally around uh, an opportunity as a church is Serve Day. That's coming up in September, September 24th. Registration is gonna open in a few weeks, but I would encourage you to circle, underline, highlight, Put a pin in that date, September 24th. We'd love to see our entire church come together on that day. All four of our campuses are gonna be engaging in projects on September 24th, that's a Saturday. Here at the Cross Point campus, we have some really great things in store. And I just gotta tell you, I'm, I'm thankful to God for the way that he is opening doors and giving us opportunity to be engaged in the community around us. This is continuing to move in that direction as we trust the Lord for doors to open, just like I was talking about. We're praying regularly, God, would you use us? Would you open doors of opportunity for us to do that? And so we're gonna be serving uh, with the town of Amherst. The town of Amherst Community Center is opening just down the road from us. And so we're gonna be painting in this space. We're gonna be pulling some wire and installing some stuff. And it's gonna be an opportunity for us to be a blessing to our local community community so that those that are younger who are coming to the community center, that we get to be a part of that. It's a door that's opening for us to serve ongoing, not just as a one-time thing. We're also gonna serve some senior citizens in the town of Amherst. The uh, Amherst Community Center, uh, Amherst Senior Center is giving us names of people who could use some help in our town. And so we're gonna show up at their property and we're gonna help with moving heavy items and trimming bushes and those kinds of things as a way to be a blessing to the community. And then we're also gonna be uh, serving at, Wind at uh, Heim Middle School. Last year we were at Windermere Elementary School and we uh, helped with their courtyard this year. We're going to be at High Middle School. Maybe some of your uh, students are a part of the Williamsville School District, and uh, we met with their staff this past week, and we're going to be serving there as well. So cool things are happening on September 24th. I'd love for you to keep that date on your calendar and be part of that. We're really looking forward to that as a way to participate in the mission around us, to be uh, salt and light, to be a representation of the church in the places where he, uh, God has put us. A couple things also I wanna let you know about that are happening related to training. We, we really do value the opportunity to grow together as disciples. We're doing that on Sunday morning, by the way. In just a minute, Pastor Jonathan's gonna be up here and we're gonna be opening the word and he's got a great message to share with us. That's part of how we grow. That's part of how we learn. That's part of how we mature is we get around God's word and we listen to what he has to say and then we ask God, how do you want us to apply that in our life? 
There are other opportunities for us to do that though throughout the life of the church. One of those is foundations. If you're new to faith, or if you uh, wanna get back to basics, or maybe you're interested in believer's baptism, foundations is a great environment for you to, to be a part of that. It's starting on September 11th at either 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. And uh, it's a four week class that leads towards believer's baptism if you're interested in that. And you can sign up at thechapel.com slash discipleship to be a part of that. Again, a great environment if you uh, wanna get back to basics and learn some of the foundational truths of our faith as you prepare for that. Also, Dr. Dion Drake is out in the atrium today and uh, he would love to talk with you if you're interested in taking one of his two classes that he's offering here at the Cross Point campus. The first one is called Journey Through the Bible. It's a 36 week class where he's walking through every single book of the Bible, asking the question, why was it written? How does this book apply to the whole narrative of scripture? And then some application along the lines of that. Great opportunity starting early September for that. And then also he's calling one Spiritual Formation Experience 100. It's a 100 100-day challenge where you're doing some kind of uh, spiritual formation challenges that are going to stretch you and grow you, help you to mature in these things. And uh, again, Dr. Drake is a wonderful teacher. He'd love to talk to you out at the Connection Center as you're leaving if you want to sign up for one of those, all right? And then just a celebration point related to training, because we talk a lot about classes and environments and also opportunities to serve. This past week, we had something that we called Rhythm Retreat, and it was uh, a bunch of uh, young adults, students who are already serving in our church in, in a role with like a musician or a technical role or things like that. And so our team poured into them. It was really cool to see a whole bunch of 10 to 15 year olds hanging out in a room, learning what it looks like to serve in their local church. And so I was just really encouraged to see that. This is a part of how we contribute to the body of Christ. And as we train people up to be able to accomplish that using the gifts and the abilities and the talents, young folks who are discovering who am I, how God has God made me and how do I fit into the body? It was a really, really cool thing to see and good as an example for us as adults to remember as well, right? We're asking those same questions. God, how do you wanna grow me? How do you wanna train me? How should I be serving? in the context of a local church. So really cool stuff that's happening. As I said, uh, Pastor Jonathan's gonna be up in just a moment and I'm gonna take an opportunity to pray for us as we prepare to open God's word and hear from uh, him this morning. So would you pray with me as we prepare for that? Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for all the ways in which we've already had the opportunity to express our love and our worship to you. God, we are so thankful that you are trustworthy, that you are good, that you are full of mercy. God, that you, you wanna meet with us today. So I pray that as we prepare our hearts to hear this message, as we prepare to open up your word, we thank you for the way that you've revealed yourself to us. We thank you for the gift of an environment like this where we can come together to learn and to grow. Father, may this not be an opportunity only for us to hear information, but instead may we open our hearts to be receptive to what you wanna to say to us today. And may we have the courage to apply it as you speak to us. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Good to see you, glad you're with us today. If you're joining us from our Chictawaga, our Lockport, our Niagara Falls campuses, good morning to you and those watching online. So glad you're here today. We're gonna be in Hebrews chapter 11, so if you have a Bible with you, please turn to Hebrews 11 and we'll be there in just a moment. Uh, we're continuing our sermon series called The Hall of Faith and we're looking at these, uh, some select, select verses from Hebrews chapter 11 um, and in this chapter, the writer of Hebrews has uh, given quite a list about um, individuals from the past who lived by faith. And we've come to this chapter before and some other times in different years, and we're coming back to it again because this is quite a long list. And so in, in this chapter, we see a lot of people that maybe stand out in, in our memory of, of the Bible, the heroes of our faith, like, like Noah or Abraham or Jacob or Moses. Uh, we've got all of those, kind of like the all-star team, right, of the Old Testament, right? But even though we've got this great list, there's also some uh, names in this list that maybe we'd be surprised by and even maybe wondering why are they even in this list? Um, because maybe, maybe they had some things going on in their life that would make us say, really them? They're on this list? Now we know that none of Hebrews 11, none of the people listed in Hebrews 11 were perfect because they were people. So they were flawed. We understand that. We get that. Uh, Noah had a problem with his vineyard after the flood, right? Abraham lied about his sister twice, uh, his wife being his sister. Not a good move in a family household, right? Um, Moses had a temper. Let's just be honest. Call it what it is. So even though they were flawed, we get that the general trajectory of their lives was one of faith. And so we're all good there. 
Um, especially because Hebrews chapter 11, beginning in verse 1, uh, defines faith this way. Now, faith is the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. So we get that. We understand, okay, they were commended for their faith. This is what the ancients, this is what our, our spiritual ancestors, if we could say it that way, were commended for. And we get that. Even for flawed people, we get the trajectory of their life. But there's other names that maybe we have to pause a little bit longer because we, we hear it or we read it and we think, hmm, that's interesting. Case in point, where we're going to be today. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31 starts this way, just the first part. By, by faith, the prostitute, Rahab. How's that for an introduction? By faith, the prostitute. Those don't typically go together, those terms. Or like the King James Version that I grew up reading and memorizing and hearing. By faith, the harlot. Just seems to carry an extra sense of weight, doesn't it? By faith, the prostitute, Rahab. Now you hear that, you look at that, you see that in Hebrews chapter 11, and you think, why Rahab? Why does Rahab make the list, and especially with this kind of identifier, her profession? Why does Rahab end up in Hebrews chapter 11? Well, to answer that question, maybe we need to go to her story. And some of you maybe have never heard her story or only heard parts of it before. So while you're holding a place in Hebrews 11, I want you to flip over to Joshua chapter 2, which is in the Old Testament. So after you've navigated from Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, find your place in Joshua. And as you're getting to Joshua, we'll, we will be in chapter 2 in just a second. Let me just set the stage for you. The people of Israel have completed their 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. All right, shout out, tales from the wilderness, anybody, right? Okay, they've completed these 40 years uh, of wandering in the wilderness, and now they're on the precipice of entering into the promised land. So they get to kind of this Jordan River uh, that is kind of the dividing line for them, and, and they're there on the banks of the river, and God tells the people of Israel to go, in, go up into the land. And then this is the backdrop for when we first meet Rahab. So here's what Joshua chapter 2, beginning of verse 1 says. Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from... Do you want to say it? <laughs> he, he sent two spies from Chautauqua. Let's just go with that, all right? So go look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab, and they stayed there. The king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab, bring out the men who came to you and entered your house, because they've come to spy out the whole land. But the woman had taken the two men and had hidden them. She said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they came, had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, they left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax she had laid out on the roof. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of the Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut and it wouldn't open until morning. This is how we meet Rahab. She's a resident of Jericho, which is to say that she was a Canaanite she was from the land of Canaan. She was not only a Canaanite, but she was a pagan. So she didn't worship the one true God. In addition to that, we know her profession. She's a prostitute. And on top of all of that, the fir her first recorded words in Scripture are a lie. Or at best, a half-truth. Oh yeah, sure, they were here, but I don't know where they are. You might, yeah, you, you could tell she's had some practice covering up for some of her visitors before, right? This is Rahab. This is how we meet Rahab, a Canaanite, pagan, lying prostitute. And this person is in Hebrews chapter 11 by faith. What's that about? But it's important to note what we just talked about, that list that she wasn't an Israelite, she didn't worship the one true God, she was a woman of ill repute, and she had a lying problem. 
None of those things are why Rahab is in Hebrews 11. Why is she in Hebrews 11? Why is she named? Because of her faith. Remember Hebrews 11 verse 2? This, this is what the ancients were commended for. Well, what's the this? The kind of faith that is confident of what we hope for and assurance of what we do not see. This is what Rahab then, therefore, is commended for. We just haven't read about her faith yet. So we have to keep reading. Stick with me. There's a lot of verses here. Verses 8 through 24 of chapter 2. So don't miss this. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, to, to the spies, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We've heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, who you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them and that you will save us from death. Our lives for your lives, the men assured her. If you don't tell what we're doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. So she let them down by a rope through the window for the house she lived in was part of the city wall. She said to them, go to the hills so the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourselves there for three days until they return and then go on your way. Now the men had said to her, this oath you made us swear will not be binding on, the, on us unless when we enter the land you have tied this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you have brought your father and mother, your brothers and all your family into your house, if any of them go outside your house into the street, their blood will be on their own heads. We will not be responsible. As for those who are in the house with you, their blood will be on our head if a hand is laid on them. But if you tell what we're doing, we will be released from the oath you made us swear. Agreed, she replied. Let it be as you say. So she sent them away and they departed and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. When they left, they went into the hills and stayed there three days until the pursuers had searched all along the road and returned without finding them. Then the two men started back. They went down out of the hills, forded the river and came to Joshua, son of Nun, and told him everything that had happened to them. They said to Joshua, the Lord has surely given the whole land into our hands and all the people are melting in fear because of us. There's a lot here, isn't it? There, there's quite a bit going on in this story. The two spies return to Joshua and they, they tell him everything that had happened. And this scene had to have been so comical. I wish that we could read just a little bit behind the, peel a little bit behind the curtain because they come back to Joshua and he says, okay guys, how did it go? Well, we got into Jericho and we went to this lady's house to spend the night. You did what? No, 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 it's fine. She was a prostitute. You did what? No, it's, it's all good. They found out that we were staying there right away and they sent messengers after us. Wow, great job, James Bond. You're the best spy ever, right? You get into the city and you're immediately found. I wonder if like at a point Josh was just like, this is the best I have. Like the, we're doomed, right? And he was a spy before himself uh, 40 years earlier. So he knew a thing or two and he's probably just like, man, there's no way. And then, you know, they're elbowing each other. Tell, tell Joshua what she said. Tell, tell him what she said. Well, yeah, I mean, the Lord gave us the land and uh, everyone's melting in fear. They use Rahab's words as the report, which is incredible. So her, her testimony, if you will, becomes the grounds for their report to Joshua. But you might be thinking, okay, so she negotiates, I mean, she's, she's shrewd, right? Like she's streetwise. So she negotiates with these two young men, these two spies. She negotiates with them. She shows them some hospitality. She also protects them from the messengers of the king of Jericho. And she, she works out a peace treaty basically for herself and for her own household. Is this what qualifies her for the hall of faith? Just that? That she told a half-truth and spared the spies and they've, 
were bound to their word. Is that why she's in Hebrews 11? Well, first of all, don't discount that. But second, let's press in a little bit further on her story. Because remember, we're, we're talking about by faith. So what, here's the key question for today. What can we learn from the faith of Rahab? Rahab the prostitute, right? What can we learn from her faith? And there is much for us to learn. Here's the first thing. True faith remains standing even when it stands alone. True faith remains standing even when it stands alone. This is from the life of Rahab. Look at uh, the next part of Hebrews 11:31. 31. I didn't show you this part earlier. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient, and there's more, but the first thing we learn is that she didn't perish with those who were disobedient. Well, who were they? The residents of Jericho, the Canaanites. She didn't perish along with the rest of the Canaanites. Now you gotta understand, Canaan was not a good place to be in these days, especially in Jericho. I mean, the people of Canaan committed heinous evil, wickedness, sin, unrighteousness that was a stench in the nostrils of God. And so he had committed to decimate this city as they really uh, just threw off any knowledge of God and went in a completely opposite direction. Though they were neighbors to the Israelites in some strange way, they they went headlong into sin. In fact, when you read in Leviticus, um, which I knew, I know you were doing this morning because it's a great devotional book, right? The red heifer and all of the sacrifices and the bread offering, right? But in Leviticus 18, 19, and 20, there's a bunch of uh, ethical codes. And if you read them and you study the history of the people of Canaan, most of the laws given in Leviticus 18, 19, and 20 are like the opposite of what was the common practice in Canaan. So even in Leviticus 18, God says specifically, do not practice what the Canaanites practice. And then there's all these things that we read that sound pretty severe and also pretty strange, like not even Law & Order SVU would touch that, right? Like it's just that weird. And that's because it was common in Canaan. Infanticide, child sacrifices, cult prostitution, orgies, you name it. I mean, it was, it was not a good place to be. And this was the environment that little Rahab grows up in. It's not conducive to faith in the one true God of Israel. Quite the opposite. Yet she stands out in this crowd. Did you hear what she said to the spies? Look at it again in Joshua chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. She said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. Pay attention here. She calls the God of the Israelites by his covenant name. In Hebrew, the Lord your God is Yahweh, or sometimes we say Jehovah. The Lord your God, for I know that Yahweh is God. Now we miss that because we just sail right past it. But you gotta imagine, she doesn't use a generic term for God. Like, oh yeah, your God. She uses his covenant name that was revealed to Moses. Now, have you ever been around someone who, to your knowledge, isn't a follower of Christ? Keep this here for one second. And all of a sudden, they say something to you like, yeah, so I was watching uh, the chapel and Pastor Jerry was talking about, and you're just like, wait, hold on, what? First of all, you know about the chapel. You know about the chapel live stream and you know who Pastor Jerry is? What's going on? You know, right? That you become a detective. Like, are, are they like searching out on their faith? What's going on here? They just drop it in the conversation casually. Like, that needs more attention. I imagine that's what it felt like for them because they're talking to Rahab the prostitute in Jericho, in Canaan. And she's like, well, yeah, you know, I'm, uh, Yahweh. What? She uses it four times in these short verses. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord, Yahweh, 
that you will show kindness to my family because I've shown kindness to you. Did you catch this? She uses his covenant name four times. She knows about what God is going to do. He is going to give you the land. She's certain. And she knows about God's past track record. She says, we've heard about the Red Sea and about what you did to the two kings of the Amorites, which, if you're tracking in the story of Israel, really is the bookends of their journey in the wilderness. Because the Red Sea was 40 years ago. The destruction of the kings on the east side of the Jordan, that was recent, because they're right there on the east side of the Jordan. It's like us, it would be like if someone said, I know what your God has done from A to Z. She's been keeping track. How long, we don't know. But Rahab's faith stands out to me because she alone out of Jericho, she alone out of this, this mess, this cesspool of sin, she alone stands out and stands by faith. Did you hear it? We heard about what God did. Our hearts melted, but I know that God has given you the land. Did you hear that? True faith remains standing even when it stands by itself. What about you? What about your faith? When you're the only believer at work, when you're the only believer in your family or in your neighborhood or in your group of friends, you know, the friends that you all partied with in college and then everybody grew up and you found Christ along the way or rather he found you along the way and now you get together with those friends again and they're still kind of where they were and you're not there anymore, but you still want to be a friend to them? What's your faith doing there? What does your faith look like then? Does your faith remain standing? I remember when I was 18 years old uh, and my parents pulled away from my college, my Christian college, and there I was all by myself. And some of you maybe are watching this weekend from your college dorm or with your family as they're preparing to drop you off and do the same thing. Or maybe it's your first week alone wherever you are. And I remember this feeling like, oh my gosh, I'm alone. Like this, I am, I mean, there's 13,000 other people here, but I'm alone. I knew a couple people here and there, but it was a really strange feeling. Like I'm a grown up now. I have to make grown up decisions. And I think my parents drove away on a, a Saturday and so I went to bed that night and woke up Sunday morning. And for the very first time in my whole life, I woke up and no one was there to tell me it's time to get ready for church. Now I was on a Christian college campus. And so I, you know, I wasn't waking up early. It was, I mean, 9.30 would be a, a generous description of the time. And so I, you know, I look over at the, the two guys that are in my dorm room and they're out cold snoring. You know, they're, they're dead to the world right now. And I, I opened the door and looked down the hall where 71 other guys lived and not a sound. No sound from the bathroom, showers, no, no sound in the hall, nothing. And this may seem like a really small thing to you, but at the time and even now, it, it seems like it was a really big deal because there was this crisis point for me. No one was going to tell me to get ready for church. Uh, that decision had been made for me for 18 years, and rightfully so. But no one was going to tell me. None of my dorm mates were going to give me a hard time. There was, there was no human accountability for this decision. So the easy decision would have been go back to bed. And that's what I considered. But for some reason, and I remember this, this is, you know, August 2006 to now. So all these years later, I remember this, 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 this decision point. Is my faith mine or is it just my parents? And I had inherited a rich legacy. But was this going to be mine? And like, I'm going to invest in my faith? Or is this just something that mom and dad make me do? So for the very first time in my life, I got up, got ready, drove to church, sat by myself. I don't remember the sermon that day, but I remember the decision. Because even in that environment, my faith felt like it was standing alone. But those are the kinds of moments that God grows and develops our faith. And he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. 
True faith remains standing even when it stands alone. But there's a second thing that we learn and it's that true faith sacrifices the seen for the unseen. True faith sacrifices the seen for the unseen. When you think about it for Rahab, there was a golden opportunity in her lap. She could have manipulated the situation with the guards from the king to get a bribe. Hey, I'll tell you where those spies are, but it'll cost you. She could have done the same thing for the spies. Hey, I'll protect you. I can, I can cover this up. I can make this problem go away, but it'll cost you. And we wouldn't be surprised if a Canaanite lying prostitute did something like that. We wouldn't be surprised. But she doesn't go for the, maybe the thing that's familiar or the thing that's easy. She reaches for what is unseen and what is yet to be revealed. She doesn't operate over here. She operates over here. And true faith does that. True faith is willing to sacrifice the seen for the unseen. The rest of our verse in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31 says, by faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. But I need you to understand that this isn't just like, oh man, that, uh, that Canaanite hospitality, that's really great. It's not about that. It's about what the hospitality meant. Because what Rahab is doing, even in defying the king of Jericho, is that she is signaling and deciding that she sides with the God of the Israelite army, not with the people from which she came. She sacrifices what was known and familiar and what she could see for what was unknown and what she couldn't see. She, she doesn't go with the king of Jericho. She instead, instead decides, I'm going to go with the God of Israel. And the writer of James, when he's talking about faith without works, and he says, you know, faith without works is dead. Remember that passage in James? He uses two examples to talk about the kind of faith that acts on that, that acts for the unseen, not just on what is seen. And the two examples that James uses are Abraham, which, okay, that makes sense to us. But you know what the second example that James uses about faith without works is dead? Here it is in James 2. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous? There's a righteousness at work for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. Two examples on faith without works is dead. Abraham, got it. Rahab, hmm? Is Rahab even in your top 10 examples of people of faith? If you're thinking, oh, I'll follow up Abraham with Jacob. Nope. James goes to Rahab. Why? Because she consistently makes decisions consistent with the fact that she had a confidence in what she hoped for and an assurance in what she did not see. So she puts a scarlet rope out her window and she takes confidence in the fact that this is gonna be the signal to her deliverance. She can't see the deliverance, but she acts on what she has been given, this faith, and that faith leads her to do it even though she has no real guarantee other than these two young, very bad spies giving her their wor her word, their word. That's really all she's got. Now you hear that scarlet cord and you're like, Jonathan, that's, psh, talk about Jesus. This is your moment right now. Okay, hold on. I agree with you. But as one scholar said, we don't need to go forward just yet. We actually need to go backward so that we can go forward. Because that scarlet cord for the Israelites was signaling something unique to them. You see, in the, there was something that was true for the people of Israel that was not yet true for Rahab. That the people of Israel, every one of their families that was in Egypt in slavery, all had this in common. They all walked out through a door that was covered in red. The very first Passover, their ancestors painted the door posts with lamb's blood. And every one of those families walked out under a door that was painted red. So now Rahab hangs out this scarlet red cord out her window as a signal to the Israelites that this one will be spared. And just like at the Passover, everyone who's in the house will be passed over. 
I know it doesn't seem to make sense to paint this doorpost with lamb's blood, but it will. And everyone who's inside will be passed over. So now in Rahab's story, everyone who's inside, make sure your father and mother and brothers and sisters are all in there with you. For wherever that red cord is, they will be passed over. And so she, she's spared. She's spared because she sacrificed the seen, what was familiar, what she knew for the unseen. This was an act of faith. This is why Rahab is described as someone who acted by faith. But not just that. In her story, as we continue through the chapters of the book of Joshua, we come to Joshua chapter 6. And the Israelite army is preparing to take the city of Jericho. And so they're marching around the city. You remember this? They march around the city every day for a week. And then on the seventh day, they march around seven times. But as they're preparing to take the city of Jericho, they're not setting up catapults or getting their weapons ready or you know, anything like that. They're playing trumpets and shouting. They're basic, basically a glorified marching band, all right, if we're just being honest, okay? And, and no one's ever been afraid of a marching band. If we're, I mean, are we serious? You know, yeah, guys, just walk around. Don't worry about the swords, don't worry about the swords. Just grab your trumpets. This is how we're gonna take over the city of Jericho brass buttons. Like that's what the key is. And yet what happens? Joshua chapter six tells us in verse 20, when the trumpet sounded, the army shouted. And at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged straight in and they took the city. Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, go into the prostitute's house and bring her out and all who belong to her in accordance with your oath to her. So the young men who had done the spying, that's generous description, went in and brought out Rahab, her father and mother, her brothers and sisters, and all who belonged to her. They brought out her entire family and put them in a place outside the camp of Israel. Hold on to that. Then they burned the whole city and everything in it, but they put the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron into the treasury of the Lord's house. But Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with her family and all who belonged to her because she had hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho, and she lives among the Israelites to this day. So first, they take Rahab and her family and they put put them outside the camp. It's because they were unclean Gentiles. They couldn't reside with the Israelites. That's the first part. That makes sense. But did you catch what verse 25 said? And she lives among the Israelites to this day. She lives in Israel to this day as of that writing, right? Basically, if you don't believe me about this, you can go ask Rahab. But more than that, you don't have to be a biblical scholar to understand what the law of Moses said to do about prostitutes. That there was to be no sexual immorality in the people of Israel of any kind. And that there would be even capital punishment awaiting anyone who did. But Rahab sticks around. Now, later in Israel's history, there was plenty of compromise. Like in the era of the kings after David and Solomon, like that era, there was plenty of compromise, but this wasn't one of those times. This was, this was a season of devout allegiance to God and his law as they prepared to enter the promised land. So this was not a wishy-washy time. So what does that mean for Rahab? if she was still around. She gave up her career. She gave up her livelihood. She was no longer Rahab the prostitute. She was Rahab the former. She gave up all she knew. She gave up economic stability. She gave up earthly pleasure. All for the Lord your God, who is God alone. She sacrificed the seen for the unseen. What has your faith cost? What are you willing to pay? Some of you don't have to think hard because you've had, you've been passed over at work and though it was never said explicitly, you know. 
You've lost friendships. You've lost family members who thought you just went off the deep end. And maybe when you got baptized and your family of origin said, well, why did you do that? We already took care of all that stuff for you. And, and now you don't even have a close relationship with them because you knew that you wanted to follow Jesus no matter what, no matter who. Some of you don't have to think. It will cost you. It will cost you something. But as many have, have said before, it will cost you more not to follow Jesus. It will cost you to follow him, but it will cost you more not to. It cost Rahab something, a lot of things, but it would have cost her way more because she would have gone with the disobedient into oblivion. True faith sacrifices the seen for the unseen. And then a, a last point, true faith rewrites the family legacy. True faith rewrites the family legacy. You know, we don't know much about Rahab's family. Uh, it's a little, we're a little scarce on details, save uh, just a few places. And one of those we read already. Look at Joshua chapter 6, verse 23. It says, so the young men who'd done the spying went in and brought out Rahab, her father and mother, her brothers and sisters, and all who belonged to her. They brought out her entire family and put them in a place outside the camp. So we've got father and mother, brothers and sisters, and all who belong to her. Well, that could have been any number of people, cousins, nieces, nephews, grandparents, aunts, uncles. Could also have been co-workers of Rahab's. Or maybe, depending on her position and rank, employees. This group. Either way, one thing's for sure. There's some... There's a conspicuous absence of a husband or children. Rahab has no husband and no heirs. Now, even in Canaan, prostitution was tolerated, not celebrated. It was a necessary evil, if you will. But she lived on the margins. Her house is on the wall. You can't even get more marginal than that. And so even in their time, even in this setting of Jericho that I, that I described, Rahab was in a not only financially vulnerable position with no husband and no heirs, she was in a socially shameful one, even in her place. But this isn't the last time we hear from her. We, we don't hear from her again in the Old Testament. But this isn't the last time we hear from her. When Matthew sat down to write his gospel, he begins with a genealogy. And so, I know, you can be honest, when you come to the lists of so-and-so begat so-and-so, let's just call it a skim, right? Let's just call it a skim. Yeah, okay, yep, all oh, right, yep, still there, still what I thought it was, good, okay. Good, get to the, now where's Jesus healing people? Let's get to that, right, or Christmas. We won't call it a skip, just a skim. But don't do either for this part. Matthew chapter one says, this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Aminadab, Aminadab, the father of Nashon, Nashon, the father of Salmon, Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. True faith rewrites the family legacy. You gotta understand that for a Hebrew genealogy to contain the names of women was not just unusual, it was unheard of. And the fact that there are four women listed in this genealogy is astounding. The fact that, the fact that two of those women are not even Jewish is astounding. And the fact that one of those non-Jewish women in the lineage of the Messiah is a prostitute is just baffling. 
but this is what happened. So apparently, Rahab gives up her profession and moves in with the camp of Israel. And apparently, she meets a man named Salmon. And what a, an amazing man he must have been. Now, we don't know much about him, but he decides to knowingly marry a Canaanite former prostitute and make her his wife. We don't know much about him, but we know their son, Boaz. And we know that in the story of Ruth, Boaz is called a worthy man, and worthy men don't just appear. They're not just out there. They require training. Could it be? Could it be that, and maybe you've even wondered this, like why does Boaz take such an interest in the Moabite widow named Ruth. Could it be that it maybe reminded him of a story he had heard all of his life in his childhood home about how his dad married a foreign woman who became a devout follower of Yahweh? What an incredible story. Maybe, maybe you are the result of a rewritten legacy. Maybe you're here, humanly speaking, because a parent or a grandparent stood by faith when they were standing completely alone and they have deposited the seeds of the gospel into your heart until the Holy Spirit struck the match and brought forth your salvation. Maybe it would be good for you to remember the generational change that can happen. Or maybe you are the first of your family to follow Christ. Maybe you are the one standing alone. And maybe you feel very defeated sometimes about how hard it is to, to go against the grain, how hard it is to continue to walk by faith even when there's ridicule and jokes and misunderstanding about what you're even doing and why you take this Jesus thing so seriously and maybe you're feeling defeated. Maybe you feel discouraged. Maybe I could encourage you that God is gonna use your story to rewrite the family legacy. Maybe you're the, maybe you're the piece in, in this story that starts to change generation after generation after generation. Either way, faith, true faith, that's what it does. It rewrites the family legacy. After all, what kind of a story, what kind of a story has a prostitute in the lineage of the Messiah, the savior of the world? I'll tell you, a true one, a true story, a story about real people who are in a real mess because of their real sin, but they encounter a real God who provides real redemption and real forgiveness and extends real life for a real eternity. That is the kind of story that has a prostitute in the lineage of the Messiah, one about real people living in a real place and a real God who steps in. Here, here's how I would summarize the story of Rahab in a few sentences. Here's the first one. There are no unlikely candidates for mercy. I can't tell you of all the commentaries and articles and things I researched in preparation for today, how many people referred to Rahab as an unlikely candidate? And I get what we're saying. I get what we're talking about. Man, Rahab, she's an unlikely candidate because she was, even as I said, a Canaanite, prostitute, lying, right? But here's the implication of a sentence like that. Do you get it? Do you know what it is? If you say there are no like, unlikely candidates for mercy, you're saying that there are likely candidates for mercy. 
But I feel very confident to say this as well. There are no likely candidates for mercy either. There are no unlikely candidates, but that really just means that you could possibly be someone who deserved mercy. Now, they're an unlikely candidate to find the gospel. Really? Does that make you a likely one? Or me? I mean, the self-righteousness just ekes out of us, whether we want it to or not, when we say, well, they're just an unlikely candidate to find the mercy and grace of God. But are there likely ones? Remember what Jesus said about it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick? But what was the, what was the wink wink of that statement? Hey, everybody's sick. Some people just admit it, right? That was his whole point. There are no unlikely candidates for mercy because there's nothing you can do to deserve it. There are also no likely candidates for mercy. So the last thing I conclude from the life of Rahab is there are only candidates for mercy. How's that? There are only candidates for mercy. No matter what you've done or what you didn't do, you are a candidate for God's mercy. Because Rahab, out of all of Jericho, God steps in and steps down and he saves her because he knew exactly what he wanted to do with her into the story of his Messiah. What does she do to to deserve that? There are only candidates for mercy. In closing, I'll tell you a story I heard. It's a story about a woman who was involved with a man who was not her husband. And she knew that it was wrong. She knew she shouldn't. She had grown up in a legalistic, hyper-legalistic environment, even culturally around her, not just her family, but like all around her. And so she had knowledge of right and wrong. It wasn't an ignorance thing. It was, it was a will thing. And she knew it was wrong, but she did it anyway. And one day... Her worst fear came true. She was with this man alone, and she heard voices outside. And the voice is getting closer. And though she, though she knew what was right, she had this constant war going on in her battling her upbringing, but also the reality of finally someone who pays attention to me. Not to mention the the satisfaction that it brought, however fleeting. And so then just all of that combusted in that moment as she heard those voices approaching her door. And the door bursts open and if it couldn't get any worse, who's standing there? One of the leaders of, their, of her family's religious tribe. Like one of the priests, basically. And, and a small mob of guys with him. And she's mortified, and she, she grabs a shawl to cover up even just some of her dignity, and The man she was with slips out the back way or maybe he was never the concern anyway. And they they grab her and they drag her outside. It's mortifying in the daylight. And she sees a small crowd assembled and a man standing off to the side. And this religious leader grabs her and throws her into the middle of this circle of people and And she gets closer to that man and she realizes she recognizes him. She's seen him before. She she didn't know his name, but she recognized him as a a traveling teacher. And her priest yells out at the teacher, you know what our law says to do about people like this. What do you say? And the man, the teacher looked at her, but he didn't look at her body. He looked at her in the eyes. 
She was used to men admiring her figure. That, that had been true for a long time, but he looked at her differently. And then he ignored the question and looked away. And they kept badgering the teacher. What do you say we should do? You know that this is a capital punishment kind of situation. What do you, what do you think we should do? What do you say? He didn't even look up. He knelt down. Well, whoever is without this sin should cast the first stone. And he just looked down. And the woman is standing there and her eyes are closed because she wants to be anywhere but here. She's just hoping this will end and that it'll be a swift execution, that she won't suffer. But the next sounds she hears are the rocks hitting the ground. She opens her eyes and realizes she's now alone with this man and now she's uncertain because she's alone with this guy that she's never met and in, in her condition. And Jesus stands up and looks at her in the eyes and he says, where are your condemners? She could barely speak. But holding back tears, she says they're gone. And Jesus says, leave your life of sin. It's done. And I don't condemn you either. See, the gospel is for every single man, woman, and child. No one deserves mercy. That's why it's mercy. No one deserves it. But no one who comes to Jesus will ever be turned away. He will meet you and he will give you mercy. Maybe you've believed that you've done too much, you've gone too far, you've said too much, you've seen too much, you've sinned too much and that there's no way, Jonathan, there's no way, I've already made too much of a mess of things. But your past sin or present sin does not disqualify you from being a recipient of his grace. So don't believe the lie. Or maybe you, maybe you come from a place where when God saved you, he made a really great decision because your performance religiously has sustained you in your eyes. But I need you to know that your performance doesn't qualify you for his mercy either. There are no unlikely candidates. There are no likely candidates. The story of Rahab teaches us there are only candidates for his mercy. And you are one. Let's bow together for a word of prayer. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, we're gonna close our time in prayer and I'd ask you not to get up and move if you don't have to. Just take a moment and reflect on what God may have been saying to you through his word today about what he wants you to do. So before you, before you even start to ask for anything else, just tell God, I'm listening. Reflect on what God's teaching you. Say, God, I'm listening to you. You've got my attention. Just tell him that. Take a moment. Pray. As we close our time today, we're going to take a few moments, as Pastor Jonathan just said, to reflect on what we've heard and I want to encourage you to, even as I'm speaking, remain in a posture of prayer and ask the Lord to speak to you. We know he's faithful to do that and heard an incredible message of truth. We want to ask God how we individually should apply that. And so as we're continuing to pray, I'd ask you to 
reflect on what the Lord is teaching you through the faith of Rahab. And as you're considering that, I'd ask you even more specifically to turn your attention to how God may be asking you to take a step of faith. Ask the Lord how he's calling you right now to a deeper faith. as we're continuing to pray, maybe there's something that came to mind as Pastor Jonathan was talking about the cost of this faith. So I'd ask you, is there something that the Lord is asking you to set aside for him? Ask that directly of the Lord right now. God, is there something in my life that I need to be done with, that I need to set aside, that I need to put behind me, that I need to let go in order to follow after you? And then finally, I'd ask you to turn your attention towards application. Ask the Lord for wisdom in what you've learned this morning. Ask the Lord for guidance in how to apply this. Ask the Lord for courage to be willing to do what he said to do. And as we remain in a posture of prayer, we're gonna take some time remaining in this room to do that. But a few different things that I'd invite you to. One is, as we conclude and I pray, after you've spent time in prayer, if you'd like to leave, you certainly are welcome to do so. You can just slip out quietly in just a moment. You can also remain here and you can pray. We're gonna keep this as a quiet room with a posture and environment of prayer because you may wanna to continue to do business with God and in this moment, you don't wanna miss it. You don't wanna zoom past it. You don't wanna microwave this, but you wanna spend time with the Lord, do that. Don't rush out of here if you don't want to. And last, we're gonna have a few folks who are gonna be standing right in front of the platform here. They can make their way right now. And you'll see them standing here. If you'd like to pray with somebody. Sometimes there's just things that are happening in our heart and we just need to, to pray with someone, to work something out, to be prayed over. Maybe specifically, it was what Jonathan was talking about a minute ago in putting your faith and trust in Jesus. These folks are down here, they have Bibles. They have some things they'd love to hand to you. If you wanna come down and say, I wanna give my life to Jesus. Would you pray with me along those lines? Would you help me in that decision? They would love to do that. Or maybe it's something you, you know Jesus, but you, you wanna come down and just say, would you pray for me about this specifically? You don't have to use a lot of words. You can just say, pray for me about this category. We would love to pray over you, pray with you and encourage you. And so again, if you wanna remain, if you wanna stay and pray, feel free. If you wanna come down front and ask someone to pray with you, please feel free. And if you feel like you've concluded this time and you want to slip out quietly, just do so respectful of others. Father, I thank you for this opportunity as we conclude our time today to be able to commune with you. Let us not be just hearers of the word, but doers of it. We thank you for the gift of this rich teaching we've received today, the example of faith in the life of Rahab and how it applies to our lives. God, may we be obedient to what you are specifically speaking to us about. We thank you for the grace that you show us in speaking to us, in directing us. God, may we not breeze over that direction in our lives, but instead respond to what you're calling us to do. Pray in Jesus' name, amen.